Hi, everyone. This is Rico Figliolini, host of Peace for is Live. Glad that you're able to join us. We have a special guest today, uh, but before we get to Alex, I'm going to just want to say thank you to our listeners for being out there. Um, this is brought to you by Peach Tree Corners Magazine, uh, and we are uh, moving on to a full schedule where we should be posting every week a new podcast of different interviews with different people of different parts of the city. But today, we have the city council member with us. We have Alex Wright of District 3, uh, who's been a city council member since 2012, actually. So let's let's bring Alex on. Let's bring him right in here. Hey, Alex. How are you? I'm good. Good afternoon. Yeah, good to good to have you here. So we're recording this on a on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, this is going to be simulcast live on Facebook and YouTube uh, in a few days. So I'm glad that you're going to be with us. And we're going to be talking over the next half hour about things going on in the city, things that are near and dear to your heart, and being able to be able to talk about uh, experiences you've had and some new things going on in this city. So I'm glad to have you with us doing this. It's an opportunity. Yeah. So the first thing, you know, I have to ask you, because it's been a long time since I've had you on, um, and we've gone through COVID. I know you work for a major corporation, a consumer corporation out there. You know, how has it been being able to transition now, being that people are, are coming back to work to a degree? There's some hybrid stuff going on. There's still some remote stuff going on, quite a bit of that, actually. And if I listen to the, um, uh, the two recruiters, it sounds like no one wants to go back to work and no one wants to actually go back into the office to work. They all want to be remote. Right. Um, so so how are you finding it out there, corporate and government-wise, working? You know, I think our company, like probably most companies, are kind of feeling their way about where they want to end up. I think that you know, they realize they're not going to be going back to what it was with everyone there five days a week, no exceptions. But I also think that with, with some exceptions, that being remote like all the time, uh, and there's exceptions to that, that maybe that's not the best model either because I think you do need the human contact on some level to, you know, especially for you bringing on new employees. Uh, you know, how do you integrate them into the culture of your company? How do you bond with them? Which you can do it remotely. It's just, I don't think, as effective. So, I, I think we're no different than pretty much any organization just trying to figure that out. I, there was an article recently in the Wall Street Journal about two of the big investment banks there. Mm. That, like, we're going back, you know, just like we were before. And the article was talking about how some of their competitors are looking at that as an opportunity to steal some of their workers away. Right. And I, I do think I recently hired someone a few months ago and probably like in their late twenties, early thirties, like everyone I interviewed was about that age. And that was a consistent question I got was, what is going to be your you know, new, new normal? And I do think that that will become a, you know, something people will look at when they're, you know, they got the salary, they got the location, you know, all the different things. That'll be something that they'll compare with. And I think if you're a company that says, we're going to be old school, you will probably have to, to pay you know, some type of premium to get people to do that because it is a, I mean, my office is over near the Brave Stadium. When I used to have to commute over the top end every day, that was a, that was a quality of life issue. And, and not having to do that, you, know, you get two hours of your day back that yeah. you can, maybe you're not working those full two hours, but you're definitely working some of that. So the company to a certain extent is, you know, getting more production and there's plenty of evidence that shows that that's you know, the case. So I, so I think it'll be some kind of mix. You know, each company will figure out what works for them. That's interesting. I was listening to that Wall Street Journal podcast, actually, of that article. And they were talking about, I think it was Chase and Morgan Stanley, where they said, no, we want people in because even though they learn all this stuff in college, they really are re-educated when they get into that environment of trade, investment, and all that stuff, investment banking. I guess because they want to teach some trade secrets you really can't learn over Zoom. Because yeah. you don't want people recording those things, maybe. I don't know. But it's kind of interesting how they frame it, like you said, that you have to – some some jobs need to be done, I guess, to degree in person. But 
Most jobs, I think people are finding out just as easy doing it remotely and actually better. You know, you mm -hmm. save two hours of, tra um, you know, of transit. Uh, you're probably more uh, enthusiastic about your job than you would be if you traveled an hour to get there and then leaving late or something. Yeah. Yeah, when you when I did have to start going back a little bit in April, you know, I sit there and off because when I would go back, there was no one at the office. It was just a handful of people there. And I thought to myself, you know, I spent this time getting ready in the morning, driving, you know, and then I was sitting there in my office by myself to a certain extent. I'm thinking, this really doesn't make any sense. Uh, it, it kind of brought home like the, the insanity of, you know, of doing that uh, every day. Um, but like I said, I do think that you need some. You know, some level of, of, I mean, just think about like, or like in my job, you know, we go and visit different sites with people at factories or whatnot a few times a year. And one of the main reasons you're doing is it just to kind of establish that, you know, that human bond with people. So I do think you need, uh, need that. But you know, this, like this whole collaboration idea where you've had offices, okay, we're going to have this open concept. And everyone's going to sit together and do away the offices. Mm. And then you find out that the studies say, well, actually people are less collaborative because they're sitting there at these long desks with earbuds in and because right. everyone's getting on each other's nerves. So you know, I do think there's a balance there. Yeah. So no, I, Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I agree with you. And obviously coming during COVID, that was never, that's, it's not even a good idea anymore, right? Being right. Before, everyone out in the open like that. So yeah. Yeah. And, and certain jobs like uh, Judge Judge Tracy Case and on my last podcast talked about how, as a judge, she want they did do video, a lot of video, but she said, really, you want to be able to see that person and and interact with them in an in person fashion because otherwise yeah. the other way around it's just too cold, and yeah. um, I'm sure the judgment day will be different uh, by doing it that way, sure. but so. Working with government, though, because you you know you have the private side and now you have and you have the government side. How has that been? Being able to uh, do city council meeting, work sessions, how has that worked out? Yeah, I, I would say in that case. So last night we had a work session, and it was the first time we were back in the. I can't remember the name of the room, but it's uh, uh, we're real close together. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, we had been either remote or in this big open space, you know, sitting 20 feet apart. And I would say, because think about like with the council, there's seven people and especially at work sessions, it's kind of a free flowing conversation. And I did find when we were remote uh, or, or, or even when it was spread out, it's much more, the, the conversation is just does not go as well. When I, It's not like people were arguing, but it just didn't have that natural flow to it because either you couldn't see the person or, you know, maybe someone's screen wasn't working and, you know, sometimes it's just that, you know, just the facial expressions. Uh, so I would say when you've got a situation where you've got, think about even in a Zoom call, normally you've got somebody leading the meeting and everyone's just kind of listening. It's not a seven people talking, potentially talking at the same time. So I, I think that for that particular scenario, it helps to be in person and close together. And that was the kind of feedback we were hearing last night that, you know, the mayor made several comments about how happy he was that we were all back together in that more intimate uh, right. environment. And I would agree with that. That makes sense. I mean, I've been on Zoom calls where there's 12 or 10, 10 or 12 people, and it's, it's impossible to really get a sense of a room, if you will, when you're all in different rooms and uh, yes. you can't even read what the room, if you will of what's going on and, and how to interact with people. Yeah, it's that's a tough thing to be able to do. I don't know how the Congress has done that when they've done those uh, those Zoom meetings for like C-SPAN meetings and stuff. I just, yeah, that's a tough thing. So are you all glad that you're back? I guess, are you all, uh, you know, I mean, everyone's either vaccinated or, or masked or whatever. I mean, actually, I don't, I don't think the city buildings need to I don't think you guys need to have masks. Mm -hmm. it was all removed. No, I I believe that the policy is if you have not been vaccinated, that you're encouraged to wear a mask, but it's not mandatory. And I, that's what I've seen, you know, like in my you know, regular job, same kind of thing. Like if you, 
same rules. Like if you haven't been vaccinated, you know, we encourage you to wear a mask, but otherwise, uh, you know, kind of back to normal. And that's what I think everyone on the council has been vaccinated. Maybe one person hasn't. I can't remember. You know, we don't really talk about it. But uh, last night there was nobody, no, nobody on the council was wearing a mask. There was a few people in the audience, uh, but um, very much kind of back to normal. Um, so let's jump into some of the other things going on in the city. I know, you know, obviously Curiosity Lab has been uh, gaining some more momentum now. I think yep. there's things going on there. So give us a little bit of background of what, um, what's been happening the last few months. So just to kind of give you a little context, because I was, uh, you know, I was prepping for this, this call, you know, because right. we got kind of regular job and all that kind of things. And it was almost like, you know, when we created this thing a few years ago and then the staff took the idea and breathed life into it and started doing a lot of really amazing things with it. It's like an analogy might be you've got this kid who lives at your house and then the kid leaves and goes off to college and then goes in their career. And you, you kind of know what's going on, but you don't know all, you don't know all the particulars of all the details until they come home and visit you and say, hey, this is what I've been doing. It's almost like what's going on where, so I'm just going to tell you some of the things I do know. And I suspect there's a lot more uh, out there that I'm just I'm not sure. tuned into, but a couple of big things. And I, you, I, you're probably familiar with some of these, you know, there's a conference coming up in October, uh, V to X, which is a really big deal. Uh, it's going to be in three sites uh, across the planet, Silicon Valley. I can't remember the exact city. Mm -hmm. Frankfurt, Germany, and then Peachtree Corners. And uh, it's going to be, you know, headquartered out of Curiosity Lab, but obviously with the two major hotels will be involved. And we're going to be bringing in some autonomous vehicles actually before the conference, because uh, that's kind of what the whole thing is about is, uh, you know, integrating, you know, vehicles, you know, other types of technology where you're able to, you know, move around autonomously. So obviously having those vehicles there will be uh, neat, but I think it's a minimum, the minimum, I don't say goal, but they're expecting at a minimum 500 out of town guests, maybe up to a thousand. And that will be uh, 19th to the 21st of October. Right. So yeah, they just told us a few weeks ago about this, but it's a pretty big deal to get picked. If you think about, you know, who the other two locations are, you know, to be in the yeah. same, you know, sentence with those two. I don't know. I mean, I've been to Frankfurt, Germany. I don't know how big of a tech center it is in Europe, but it's obviously a you know, major cities in Europe, for no doubt. Definitely from a financial standpoint. Uh, so that's a really big deal. That's the first time we've had a conference. Because if you think about Curiosity Lab, we launched it September 2019, and then four or five months later, bam! You know, the world stops. Yes. Uh, yeah. So the momentum we had going, you know, we had the Ollie out there, had to pull that because who's going right. to write it, right? Right. And that was after, I think, the Smart City Expo also. Was yes. September, right. I think, or June of, of that year. Yeah. So that's that's the big thing on the horizon in three months. And I made a couple of notes here. Um and one of the things that I think is going to be interesting about this uh, conference that I mean, some of this is kind of inside baseball, but you know, normally you go to these things and you'll have an initial you know, big meeting and then they'll have the breakout sessions and then the breakout session ends and everyone just kind of trickles away. So they're going to turn that model on its head where they're going to start out the day in these breakout, breakout sessions. And then they're going to end the day at the town green, like with a big kind of get together which I think will be very conducive for, you know, uh, not lobbying, but, you know, just networking. And that's a great venue for that, you know, it'd be, because part of this is an economic development play, I mean, Curiosity Lab was. And so mm -hmm. to, you know, take it to, you know, what I would argue is probably one of our two biggest achievements since we've become a city, you know, Curiosity Lab and then the town center, you know, taking that, all those people from out of town. Hey, we're just going to drop you off here. You know, 500, 1000 people. Uh, I, I thought that was a pretty good idea to, to switch, switch that up. So you've already got them there and they're just going to hopefully right. stay and uh, spend some money. 
Yeah, I mean that that's the whole idea of having conferences and conventions, right? Drawing yeah. economic, uh, drawing money to to the towns that are doing it. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and uh, so, yeah, last night at the uh, work session, so we were talking a little bit about this, but uh, they're going to have uh, two companies that are going to be coming in, and I think this is going to happen before the conference. Uh, three different autonomous vehicles. Um, similar to Ollie, but two different companies that are going to be coming and testing. And then I think even during the conference, there's going to be more than just three vehicles. Cause you know, what I had said all along was for, for, for people to be willing to get on one of these things and travel, right. it's gotta be a viable option to getting in your car, which means it's gotta come by more often every 10 minutes. Otherwise people would say, well, what's the point? So I do think they're going to try to have, I've heard as many eight to 10 running on, on, the, tr- uh, on the track, the, uh, you know, so think about you, you get out of a breakout session, a curiosity lab, okay. Hey, let's go to Anderby or let's go back to our hotel. I mean, everything's kind of right there or kettle uh, rock, which is, you know, on the other end. Um, yeah. So that was a, some an announcement last night. Uh, and another interesting announcement, and this is part I'm really excited about was, so we're in the process or the staff is in the process of negotiating an IGA, an intergovernmental agreement with the state DOT, which w- would allow the autonomous vehicles to travel up to the town center from Curiosity Lab. Because the, the reason we're able to do what we're able to do now is the city controls that road. So we didn't have to negotiate with anyone about you know, rights to do that. But as soon as you... Technology Parkway Road. They yes. City yes. Right. Technology. That's right. But you know, the minute you drive off a of Technology Parkway, say onto Spalding or right. 141, you got to mm-hmm. get, get permission. So, what they're talking about doing is using that very wide you know, sidewalk along 141 as you know a conduit to get down to the town center. Oh, really? Which, what a lot of people don't know is the origins of the whole project when we were initially this whole thing came up, it was really about a mobility initiative of, or this is before the virus, of course, we can't control people driving through Peachtree Corners, but we can potentially make it easier to get around Peachtree Corners. And so that was kind of the initial ideas, you know, how do we, you know, do that? And I'm glad that they went the direction they did, because one of the things I would have been worried about is this thing would have turned into like the shuttle down in Atlanta where no one rides it and it's like, okay, you're wasting your money. So this turned out to be a much, you know, the staff made a much better decision to, to go this route. But the, you know, the goal, well, one of the goals remains, you know, how do we make it easier to get around Peachtree Corners? How do we, you know, take people out of their cars if they want to, of course, and give them this other option to, to get around. So the, so you're saying the DOT, so one Peachtree Parkway, I think most people know, is a state uh, highway, a state parkway. So it's yep. uh, the state handles all that, the DOT. Um, so you're the city's looking to get permission not to drive on Peachtree Parkway, but to to have a mobile ve- mobility vehicle uh, riding along that wide asphalt path. That's like that's a, almost a, a wide sidewalk that goes along 141. That's correct. So that, that still falls within the state's uh, right of way. So they ultimately right. control that as well. Mm-hmm. But I think the, I'm just speculating here, but if I'm the DOT and thinking, OK, this is a good way to kind of test this concept out without getting it out actually on the road where right. the bad could happen. So does that now I'm trying to figure out, trying to remember that if that goes straight. I know that goes past Wesleyan and continues on past uh, where Lidl is, the shopping center over there. So you're talking about the really wide sidewalk? Yeah. I mean, it, it goes up, uh, you know, because they just they just finished connecting it you know, after they built the bridge. There was the, Initially, there was no sidewalk there. Well, they've now finished that out, and then it's just as wide. So you could, I mean, you if this became more permanent, obviously you would need to do something other than just have the sidewalk. I don't know what that looks like, but... Uh, huh. Just the fact that the DOT is willing to talk to us now, like it's uh, that's a really big deal. Wow. Okay, that would be. I mean, that would certainly extend 
the use of, of vehicles like that outside that that area, that 1.4 mile track. Yeah, because ultimately, if you're just you know you kind of just going about your day to day, you know, life. Mm-hmm. People say, "Well, you spent all this money on um, Curiosity Lab. What's it doing for me?" Or I, you know, I don't see anything going on. I mean, the reality is there's a lot of testing going on that none of us see. But I think it is important that we have vehicles out there because ultimately, what people are interested in was, "Well, how am I benefiting from this? My, you know, my day to day existence." That's just human nature. So when you when you can put something out there where people are like, "Well, I might actually be able to use this," and uh, yeah, I mean, I, improve my day somehow. They they get more uh, supportive of it. Yeah, I can see us getting to the point where we have five G throughout the city, and having that throughout the city because we're small enough that I think the city can do it as an infrastructure plan, right? To be able to build five G technology, so then that's what autonomous vehicles need, right? That five G yes. to be able to speak to everything. Um, to be able to do that means that these vehicles don't have to be then. They could just be right on the road with the rest of us eventually. You know, maybe yes. that's 10 years from now, but I can see that happening. Yeah, that's cool. Can't wait for that. Yeah, um, no, uh, that like, like I said, that was uh, news that we just got last night. And like I said, I was particularly excited because that is part of the, like I said, the origin story of the whole project. So to see that that's still, we're still pursuing that. Uh, Cause I think ultimately the public would probably be more interested in that than all the kind of cool uh, research that's going on. Cause they're like, well, that's not, that's not doing anything for me there. At least that's tangible. Right. No, I, I, and I get that. Although, you know, part of that builds on everything builds on itself. So, but I do get that. And I do, you know, as, as someone that lives here in the city and, is active in the city also. I can't wait for that part to be a daily part of people's lives, you know, where, you know, yeah. maybe there is a, a you know, um, where we have our own transportation system within the city that people can just loop through to get to different areas of the city, uh, to get to different retail parts, hotel to retail to restaurant. That would be cool, right? Um, yeah. So yeah. now, so if we're talking about town center and getting there, there's all sorts of things going on. Let's let's touch upon that a little bit about town center. Um, okay. I know that you know there's quite a few things coming there. Peachtree Corners Festival is going to be there this summer for the first time. Um, do you want to share? Is there you know I know you've been active in the fitness uh, trail. I think that we call it right. Uh, getting that built out, and I, and I was there just the other day, and I noticed a few a few I think one new. I don't know. There's a couple of new things. I hadn't been there in a while. So then I saw that it expanded a little bit. It looked right. like So maybe you want to tell us a little bit about, about that. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think the official name they came up with is uh, Path to Fitness, which I thought was kind of neat, you know, play on words. Uh, but for the people who are, I'm always a, kind of a, uh, interested when people email me or I'll bump into them like, oh, I didn't even know it was there. You know, they're at the town green because it's kind of in the woods and you don't necessarily notice it. But, you know, for the, yeah, for the listeners who aren't that familiar, if you're in the town green, you know, there's a series of woods there. There's actually a path through the woods that they had cut um, for the first few concerts, you know, for people to get from another parking lot. And then we, uh, you know, put some obstacles on there. It's kind of like an obstacle course, uh, really. And so there's 10, 10 different obstacles on there. There's a monkey bars, wall climb, rope climb, you know, all kind of stuff. And one of the things that I found interesting is a lot of times when I'm over there, you know, just kind of out for a walk, that when I say young people, I'm not talking just teenagers, but you'll have like kids, eight, 10. It's like they want to go play where the big people are. Like it's kind of got a cool right. factor to it, if you will. Right. Um, so to your question about what's coming next, so a couple things. One, you know, there is a playground on the green, Mm-hmm. Know about playground, but there's a couple of uh, things you can do. They've got the hill with a slide, and they've got that ar- a couple of climbing devices. And what we've seen is that those are often just over, you know, swarming with kids, which is great. That's what we want, but we, we, we they need some more things to do. And so we're actually going to build another playground, kind of catty corner to that. So if you're facing the uh, 
center bistro where the stage is Can you look right. to the left we're going to take some of that area <clears throat> in the woods and uh put some new things in there that still tbd i'm actually uh the city manager and I are actually meeting Friday morning with a, I guess a consultant for a lack of a better word to help. I mean, we have an idea of what we want, but this person kind of helped you know, vision it. Okay. Uh, but we're, what we're hoping is that will start after the concerts in this fall and that maybe we'll have it done by year end. So that will be an additional uh, playground area. And in, in addition to that, on the, on the actual, on the path to fitness, we're going to be adding four, new obstacles that hopefully will be in by September. Okay. So that's so going to be. So the fit, so the other part, the kids part though, it, I understood that maybe it's slightly older kids, like middle school age. So it won't be like small scale stuff. It'll be a little bit more challenging for like middle schoolers. Yeah. So you're not going to have like a two or a three year old on it, uh, yeah. but you know, I sit there, I was just telling you, you know, about kind of the fitness trail, which is really designed for adults and how like little kids are going to get on it. Uh, so I sus suspect that you'll have kids from, you know, six up, you know, but we want it to be kind of challenging enough where, you know, maybe some of the kids that are right now on the fitness trail will also use that because it, it, it really almost gets too crowded sometimes with so many people, which is a good, you know, that's a good problem to have. So that's why we want it to, put even more amenities in there, uh, you know, because you always got, I mean, I have four kids. I don't know how many times my wife tells, you know, get off the computer, you know, go do something. So when you see those kids out there, I mean, that's a great thing. They're running around exercising. So we want to encourage that and add more things. And uh, so hopefully all that will be done later this year. Cool. And the four things that, because I interrupted you, sorry, the four things that you were saying to the uh, Path of Fitness Trail, what are the four other items you're adding there? Um, so one of them will be like, uh, think about like rings, you know, like you're up in the air, like grabbing rings yeah. and you're going sure. from ring to ring. Uh -huh. uh, so there'll be one of those, uh, two other kind of like what climbing, uh, imagine like a wall that's an inverse wall where you're, you're climbing like up like this. So a couple of different devices like that. Um, so a lot like of it is climbing almost like almost uh, rock climbing type of thing. Yeah, a little bit like that. Um, but like I said, it is more of an obstacle course uh, type stuff. And it's, I've been amazed like how much kids like you'll see kids climbing this rope. You know, it's a twenty foot high rope, and I never could climb a rope when I was you know eight or ten. So it's been some people with some skills out there for sure. That's been surprising. <laughs> That's true. Almost scary uh, to see them do that. Yeah. Cool. So there's a lot of uh, that. That's great that the city's looking to do that, to utilize the space. When I was out there just the other day, um, I think it was a few days ago, actually, I was walking out there early morning and I'm seeing more of the town, the townhouses being built. Yes. That surrounds there. I'm almost feeling like everything looks a little smaller. Um almost felt like the veterans uh, memorial looked a little smaller than I remembered it uh, from a year ago, let's say. Uh, and I guess part of that is because you got the townhouses closer in now. I mean, they're being Yeah. Really no, I know what you're talking about. Once the, once they got right up on top of it, it, it yeah. is uh, I, the same kind of vibe, but you know, one of the things like from the beginning, what we wanted to create was kind of a, a an intimate feeling, if you will, uh, like we went up to Swanee to, to talk to them, to, you know, kind of lessons learned and, you know, they've got a beautiful facility up there. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's a kind of a downside for them is they've got two major roads uh, that border right. their, their, their town green. And it's pretty extensive. I think there's like seven acres. The green itself is. It's fairly, ours, it's fairly big. It's bigger than ours. Yeah. And ours is about two acres. Uh, and what we wanted, one of the things we wanted to do is be able to, you know, parents can come, they got their little kids and not, not that a two or three year old can't still run off, but, you know, if you're able to sit there, say one of those green rocky chairs and your kids just out there in the green running around, it's a lot easier to keep an eye on them, not worry about them getting run over because it's, you know, there's literally 
Sure. You got to really work to get near a car uh, from there. That's for sure. Yeah. No, they would really have to get right off and the parent would not be paying attention at all for them to get lost out. Yeah. And speaking of the townhomes, one of the things that when we went to Swanee, it was kind of, they had an interesting concept. They called it uh, the beach concept. And what, what they meant by that was they said, build the beach first. And what they meant was build the town green first. That's the beach. Okay. And then the people who want to live at the beach, you know, certain people like to live at the beach. Some people don't. Right. Right. They will then kind of know what they're getting in for. Like, okay, we're going to buy one of these townhomes. It's on the green. Right. Uh, there's going to be noise. And we want that. Or at least that's what I'm hoping. Because, you know, if you spend $700,000 and you <laughs> right there on the green, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that those whoever those people are don't. <laughs> Paul wants to say, hey, there's a lot of noise. Yeah. You know, I, sure. I asked someone about that that was looking to downsize. And I said, and they were about the same price range, I guess. They were downsizing too, if you will, yeah. uh, from a big house to like a townhouse. I said, well, why don't you look at one of those that's on the green? Because if you're out on your porch, you can be sipping on a bourbon and watching the concert playing yeah. across the way. That's right. And they, and they were like, yeah, there'd be too much noise. Now, of course, they're looking to retire. They were like, heading into their 60s and the, and stuff so everyone has a different feel about it right i i wouldn't mind that because yeah. i mean obviously the concert's over by 10 10 30 11 usually i mean that's it just depends on the individual i guess yeah right. yeah i mean it's it's uh you know they're, yeah they're normally over by 10 you know, there's 10 of them a year uh right. yeah it, it just depends on the person you know it's like I wouldn't want to be necessarily right on the green, but if you think about living on those townhomes, you can walk to restaurants, you can walk to a grocery store, you can walk over the bridge to a dentist office, to a doctor's office. Uh, I don't go to movies much, but if you wanted to go to a movie, I mean, literally just about anything you want, you could could walk to. So it's, and you're seeing this across the country, you're seeing it across Gwinnett County where you know people want to live in these, kind of denser downtowns, if you will, that walkability. Uh, so that's that's really what we were trying to create. Yeah. It's interesting how people can be um, lazy in a way because, you know, the parking, let's say at the Forum, the parking in the middle near the retail, everyone wants to go there. But parking away from it, that's the last place you want to park because then you got to walk, right? So, so like you're saying, I mean, if you live on the green, if you live in one of those townhouses, you can walk to anything within minutes. Yes. Um, it'll be interesting to see when that, uh, if Roberts, Charlie Roberts ends up putting up, I don't think a hotel will go up because at this point, I mean, that's one of those things that may not happen, right? right. Uh, but 160 apartment complex, seven stories, we're overlooking town, Town center. I don't know if most people know. It'd be behind the Chase Bank, that that open area that's been uh, cleared out. Right. Um, but that could be interesting. 160 families, um, you know, going out onto the town green, getting to the movies, eating and stuff. Those are apartments. You know, I mean, it could be interesting. A lot more yeah. density, like you said. Right. Um, so. Are we um, also, you know, with all this trail stuff, and I know, I know one of the things you were thinking about it was maybe, you know, one of, one of, you know, with Peachtree Corners Festival coming in September to the town green uh, and outside the roads, actually, um, because I think part of the uh, Peachtree Corners Circle Road is going to be taken up by the festival, if I yep. understand correctly. Um, so more events are going to be happening at town center and in this area, um, bigger events like this. Uh, one of the things you were talking about, uh, you know, at one point before we started this was possibly a competition, maybe something similar to a decathlon or some sort of fitness competition that maybe could happen at Town Green, maybe right. picking up using that path of fitness. Um, I mean, so there's all sorts of things that, that uh, the city can still draw upon, right? Events and such. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I kind of view... Uh, I mean, this is just a term I came up with, but, you know, creating uh, anchors. What I mean by that is things that people want to live near. I mean, often you have natural anchors. People want to live near water, you know, whether it be a river or a lake or, uh, 
you know, so in the case of Peachtree Corners, I would be our anchors as the Chattahoochee River. Or, or I, like I live right near Berkeley Lake. That's an anchor. Uh, Wesleyan, you know, my kids don't go there, but I, you know, there's people who move here to be close to that school. Oh, for sure. Park, you know, it's an anchor. So anytime, and I would argue that Curiosity Lab is an anchor where we've had companies relocate just to be near it. And so the town center is a, is a, is a new anchor. I would argue that the green itself is more important than the town center in that if you go to the town center on a Sunday or a Saturday afternoon, there's literally hundreds of people. They're just hanging out, loitering, relaxing. You go across the street to the forum. There's no, you know, there's nowhere to do that. I mean, people want to have that. And it was interesting when we were initially going through this with a developer, they had no interest in a green space because you know they couldn't quantify, they couldn't monetize it, so they didn't they didn't want to do it, and that's one of the reasons you know why the city ended up owning a bunch of it because that was the only way to make the numbers work. Where you know we weren't worried about making money per se off of the green, mm -hmm. uh, and I think what maybe the developers are starting to see is people will pay you know people are paying seven hundred thousand dollars to live on that green because you know they want to be near the action and you know hopefully what we'll see maybe across the street at the forum is that they'll kind of pick up on that and say we need something that will you know an, an activation uh, area that people want to hang out i mean the forum's a, a neat place there's just nowhere to hang out except looking at a parking lot yeah no i totally agree i think i had this conversation uh with uh, brian johnson at one point uh where i where I'm, my feeling is the way things are going. For example, there's about 13 retail shops that are closed there right now. I yeah. counted that last weekend, and I think Pooch and Paws actually is closed now. So that's up. That was up there too. So that may that may make it 14 now. Um, that that are closed retail locations in that in that shopping center closed. Um, I can see some part of that property, whether it's the office building that's on the northern side of that property or maybe the southern side where, you know, a seven story apartment, condo complex, maybe an equity owned a property would make sense versus an apartment complex. Um, I can see them maybe tunneling out a little bit of uh, the center part where the cars are and make, making, making a green space. Yep. This way people can like a pocket park almost within that. You might lose some parking spaces, but you know what really, I mean, like you said, there's nowhere to go if you yeah. just wanted to hang out. And it's, it's pretty rare that there's no parking there. Um, yes. Right. You know, one of the things that we talked amongst ourselves at one point, uh, you know, because we've talked about doing some type of art center. And right. that's right. You know, the, the center bistro location has had come up before. You know, actually during the during the original plan, you know, we tried to get a. Uh, kind of like right to first refusal, you know, to buy the property if it you know went under or maybe just have them lease it or whatever. And that that never went anywhere because even before COVID, you know, the movie industry was already struggling. So we were worried about you know, what comes with that space if it doesn't work out. But anyway, that, you know, that that hasn't there's been some discussions there, but is you know, the numbers just don't make any sense. But you know, if you think about from an activation standpoint, Look over at the form. What if, God forbid, you know, a Bell's closed or Barnes and Noble closed? Right. Well, maybe you go into one of those spaces uh, where, you know, maybe it's a long-term lease or what, but, you know, you, you might be able to change that, you know, particular building into some type of, you know, performing arts center. And that, then that becomes an anchor. That becomes an activation point. Uh, so, I'm not saying I want that to happen, but you know, there's different options down the road for things to, to happen. Yeah, and I and I don't disagree with you. I you know, Belks has closed some national stores. Uh, or nationally they've closed stores. They haven't closed this one, but that doesn't mean they won't. Barnes and Noble, a brick and mortar bookstore versus their online their own online store or right. Amazon. I am still surprised. I forget how many square feet that is. But I'm still surprised that that is opened when other businesses with smaller footprints have closed their doors. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if that, God forbid, that happens there. 
Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that hurts help helps Barnes and Noble is like I said, it's got kind of a hangout vibe to it. You know, you go in there and drink coffee and that kind of thing. And you know, people are, you know, they, they, people like to hang out with their friends and just, uh, you know, talk and there's no, think there's nowhere else in the forum that you can do that. I mean, if you go to a restaurant, you feel kind of bad taking a table up just for hours, right? You're, you're hurting the waitress. There you can do that. No one's, you're not hurting anybody. And, and there's no coffee place there. Ever since uh, I think it was Caribou, that was years ago, closed. Yep. Uh, there's really no coffee shop, sad to say. And then even a Starbucks in there, you have to go up the, down the road to, to get to that. That's uh, right. That's right. So. So there's still a lot of uh, growth potential for different things, even when there's a negative, right? So maybe if Belt goes out or maybe if Barnes & Noble or if the developer decides that they want to adjust a few things and and, yeah. you know, and redevelop it a little differently, those are all good things, no? Yeah. I, I think the biggest challenge there is with the forum is that it's owned by REIT. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, you're – there's a management company that, you know, you can interact with, but you know, they're just the, yeah. the, the face. So, cause there's been, there's been various conversations with them about some kind of creative ideas and just have not been that. Yeah. They haven't gone anywhere. So it's, you know, it's like that Jerry Maguire movie was like, help me help you. Right. <laughs> like we right. want to help you. Yeah. They're just not interested. So they're, saying, they're saying no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because they're REIT and 13 stores or 14 stores closed, it's just a write-off to them. So yeah. they don't care. They don't live here locally. They don't they don't really care. Um, and hopefully, you know, and, and the you know the other side of that with um, apartments being full, uh, very little occupancy. Um, I'm surprised even Corner Center sold. I think that was sold for $45 million uh, or $40 million at a comp apartment complex. Um, yep. A lot of money, right? Uh, you were saying land is expensive. I mean, I just saw something listed the land under Lazy Dog, I believe, with the lease of Lazy Dog, is selling. I think it's the offering is four and a half million dollars for that property because that's an app parcel, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. Right, so four and a half million for that piece of land with Lazy Dogs on it and its extended lease. I guess someone thinks it's valuable enough to all put it out. It's expensive. Yeah. I mean, we've had uh, people approach, you know, the city about, you know, the, the uh, I guess, five and a half acres of woods, you know, that border the town green. That's right. We've had people approach us about, you know, buying that and putting stuff there. And I think, I mean, nothing's forever, but mm -hmm. I think the consensus is that, you know, even though that's, you know, uh, you know money that's, I mean, you could sell it and take the money and do something with it. Right. That I think the view of the community is, you know, they like having the woods there, and mm -hmm. I think it would kind of hurt the the vibe, if you will, that 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 we've got there with the that intimate part I'm talking about. If you took the woods away and then put a bunch of new buildings, uh, right? So yeah. it just going to say, you know, that, that there's not a lot of raw land around, and so that's you know, there's people definitely interested in that. But I'm pretty confident for the foreseeable future, it'll stay woods. Cool. Well, that's good. I mean, I, if, if anything, I was thinking, you know, art center would be a great, that could be a great place for that. But um, yeah, I can't see more apartments there. Uh, no, well, I mean, we think about, it, we bought that land specifically because we didn't want not just the land with the town center, but the land with the woods was the same uh -huh. thing. We're going to go there. So yeah. it really makes sense to buy land to stop apartments and then put apartments. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I'm with you there. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely places for apartments, but I don't think that's the place for them. Well, and there's only, you know, how much density can you put pile into a place? You know, I mean, kids yeah. have to go to school. They have to be infrastructure. I mean, there's all sorts of things that, you know, people have to live. Other things that come with density, right? So That's um, right. So we've been talking with Alex Wright, city council member, um, District 3. For those that don't quite know what District 3 borders, can you tell us <laughs> so then people get yeah. uh, what, what area? So, um, I'm a very visual person, so I, I know everyone else isn't, but you know, if you kind of if you were looking at a map, it would just give you some kind of natural boundary. So, uh, you know, if the city running uh, north or running south to north, like post one is 
the south, post two is in the middle, and then post three is kind of the northern part. So boundaries would be Berkeley Lake, you know, the city of Berkeley Lake, that's kind of our northern boundary, runs all the way along the river down to about a mm, little bit past uh, Jones Bridge Park, uh, almost down to like where Simpson Wood Park is. If you know where uh, like Peachtree Corners, like the North Manor neighborhood, that's sure. kind of the southern part of Post 3, and then all along uh, West Jones Bridge, okay. up to about where the YMCA is, and then you right. take a left on Peachtree Corner Circle, you go all the way up till it dead ends at Medlock, and then a right on Medlock, and then all the way out to Norcross. So that's, that's Post 3. That's fairly big, too. So uh, Yeah, it's, it's probably about 15,000 people. You know, each post is about 15,000, and... Right. You know, for us, that's like, a, you know, who live around here, that doesn't seem like a lot of people. But one of the things that's interesting is when you go to these, uh, you know, government, they have like a GMA convention every year in Savannah where you get to interact with people from across the state, you realize that, okay, you know, Peachtree Corners is kind of the, the outlier as far as, you know, cities across the state where, you know, you're talking to the, you're in a class and the guy next to you is a mayor from a town with 2,000 people in it, the whole city, right? And... Right. Uh, kind of makes you realize, this, you know, it's a pretty big, I will not say it's top 10, but maybe it's like in the top 15 biggest cities in the state, maybe. So it's really? relatively big. Well, I didn't realize. Oh, I, think think we have, I think we have, what, 44,000 odd people, I think, in this city. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I think, I forget, 80% of those that work in the city don't live in the city. I mean, there's all sorts of statistics like that. Uh, yeah, that people would be surprised probably of. Um, cool. So if people want to get in touch with you, um, website, I guess they go to the city website and um, they can find your email address there. Yeah, they can. And I, I haven't been real good about this lately, but I do still send out a newsletter uh, every so often. And yes, I see it. Uh, but, you know, if you want to get on that distro you know, you can email me at the city and I can add you, but we've probably got about, gosh, six or 700 people on that list. And then, you know, the people forward it on. And, um, you know, it's just like a, you know, way for me to share news that's, you know, like the people who work for the city, they don't have the luxury of kind of putting their own little opinion here and there, you know, it's just straight news. And you know, sometimes people do like to hear, you know, kind of like our conversation here, like, you know, it's a little more, colorful, I guess, because you can you know, get a little more behind the scenes, what's going on and people's right. opinions. Yeah, and I've gotten your newsletters and I'm happy to get them because I, I do like the opinions that you share in there. Uh, so it, it gives me a little bit more, rather than just state the facts, ma'am, it's it's a little bit more editorializing, which is, which is good uh, mm -hmm. to see that. So thank you, Alex. I appreciate you being on the show with us. Again, this is Alex Wright, City yeah. Council Member of Peachtree Corners. Uh, if you need to reach out to them, check the city's website. And um, if you have comments, put them in the comments below. If this is on Facebook or YouTube, and I'll try to get answers for you. Thank you again, Alex. Appreciate sure. you being with us. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Have a good afternoon. You too.